Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a new season of Constellation Crew. Uh, it's really surreal to be back here, honestly, after having such a long summer break. But of course, I'm getting way too far ahead of myself. We can talk here about all of the fun experiences that we have in Constellation Crew, where we just talk about random astronomical objects or whatever is really interesting and happening in Muncie. But let's take a moment to address the real elephant in the room and the fact that for all of you returning viewers you may be seeing two new faces here um i'll first start off with myself my name is Kyrie standifer um you may have known me from our last constellation crew episodes back from last year but we have lost a couple of our wonderful people but a lot they have both moved on to do wonderful and amazing things and with that said, we can address these two new faces that we have in this room, both wonderful people that I do have the pleasure of working with every weekend. So without further ado, we can start off with what is everybody's names, um, what year and what major are you, and one fun fact that you have about each other, about yourselves. So I'm Maya, and I'm a senior, and my major is astronomy and I guess the cool fact is I do art on the side. I'm like a studio art minor, which is kind of unrelated to astronomy, but it's a real hobby of mine. I'm Jessica. Um, I'm a sophomore and I am a natural resource and environmental management major. Um, a cool fact about me is that I have a twin sister. We're identical. Um, yeah. Those are some really cool facts, you know? um honestly it's just really cool to learn more about what people do on the side or you know a bit more about family life it really builds that connection and you know that's what constellation crew is all about it's about building a connection so we can you know talk about um constellations and other celestial objects so like i already mentioned my name is Kyrie standifer i am a senior with uh going under astronomy for my major and i guess one cool fact if i didn't do it last year is I had two turtles, one named Rock and one named Grass. Why they were named that, I have no clue. I chose something when I was a kid and we stuck with it. But yeah, um, before we really start into the meat of the show that we have today, we can actually talk about something really cool that happened at the Brown Planetarium. Um, so last weekend on Saturday, we actually had our annular eclipse. And just to talk about what an eclipse is, eclipse is basically when an object is covering another object. So in this term for our annular eclipse, this is when the moon is covering our sun and it creates a shadow on the earth. But the cool thing about annular is that the moon is actually further away from the earth. So when objects are closer or farther away, they can seem smaller or larger with uh, whatever respect you're choosing. And because the moon is more farther away from the earth, it doesn't completely cover the sun. So we have like a really cool ring around it. And of course, the Brown Planetarium decided to actually host a block party. So we can go ahead and talk about what we thought. We were all there. We all had a bunch of fun. And personally, for me, I thought the block party was actually really cool. Just seeing so many people actually come up. Um, I want to say maybe around 500 people were there and we had all these fun activities and we actually hosted a live showing from NASA who actually did have an, a full video of what a complete annular eclipse would be because we're in Muncie we're way more north so we weren't able to get a full total annular eclipse but we were able to get a partial so we could see a part of that shadow and then it got ruined because there's a bunch of clouds so what did you guys think so I actually had a great time I was there with a few others on behalf of the Society of Physics students and we our station did stomp rockets and it was interesting seeing all the kids and some adults too <laughs> built their own rockets and really launch them all. It was cool seeing all the different things they came up with. Yeah, it, it honestly sounded like a bunch of fun. I was sitting really not that far away from you giving out Eclipse classes. So it was really cool just seeing all the kids just playing around with rockets. And then what about you, Jessica? Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I got my face painted, so that was fun. Um, and then we had a planetarium show going 
um, that day as well. It was Eclipse, the sun revealed. So I helped out with that. Got to talk in front of a lot of people. Um, and yeah, everyone seemed to be really enjoying themselves. It was like a very different atmosphere compared to our regular weekend programs. I really genuinely would have checked out the face painting, but I was on the <laughs> whole other side. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I did see the um, actual setup that y'all had. I did help with help setting up for that morning. So it was really cool to see and just everyone really have fun. And I really want to say probably the most important part to me was just the amount of people that just really enjoyed the event because I was sitting there at the front where people all, you know, just loop around since it was just a really big loop with activities everywhere. And just a lot of people just walking up to me, like not even asking for Eclipse lessons. And they were just like, you know, I really, really enjoy this event. The planetarium did a really wonderful thing. So I really believe that block party was a great success. And even though it was cloudy and we weren't able to actually see the Eclipse, I think I had a bunch of fun. Yeah, it was really fun seeing how excited the kids got about science. They were asking a lot of questions. Some of them, some really good questions too. <laughs> and it's just really fun seeing that they share that interest. <laughs> yep. Well, like um, a lot of teachers will say here, science is a, uh, well, more physics and astronomy. It's a community science. You can't really do everything by yourself. It takes a collective group of minds and seeing all of the kids like, really excited about science and space in general is wonderful for the future for astronomy and physics but um <laughs> but that isn't the only eclipse that we have down here in muncie as well we do have a total eclipse coming up really soon so anyone would like to cover that talk a bit more yeah, so the total solar eclipse that's coming up, which is also known as the Great North American Eclipse, is going to occur on Monday, April 8th in 2024. So it'll begin approximately at 3.07 p.m. here in Muncie. Um, so everybody has that to look forward to. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where it's going to be um, and like where the zone of totality will be. So it's gonna run through the state of Indiana and it'll start off in the Mount Vernon area and then go all the way through down to Portland. Um, so it will pass through Indianapolis, Muncie, Shelbyville, uh, places like this. So a total solar eclipse occurs basically when the moon passes in a direct path between the earth and the sun. So the moon's shadow travels over the earth's surface and blocks out the sun's light as seen from the earth. And the moon casts two types of shadows onto the earth, the umbra and the penumbra. So those who are standing in the umbra, which is the innermost and darkest part of the moon's shadow, are the ones who will be able to view the total solar eclipse. If you're standing in the penumbra, which is the lighter shadow region that surrounds the umbra, um, those, those who are standing in that area will see like the partial eclipse and won't be able to see the total one. Um, but basically during the total solar eclipse, the sky will come completely dark, like it's nighttime for about four minutes and 28 seconds. So it's very exciting. <laughs> and if you get a chance to view it, like I really recommend it. <laughs> yep. Hopefully we just, you know, don't get absolutely screwed over by Muncie weather, but I'm actually really excited. <laughs> and I know for a fact that even if I have class, I'm probably going to miss a few minutes just so I can make sure I can check it out. But yes. hopefully it's an astronomy class and, you know, <laughs> if it's Barrington, he'll most definitely make us come out anyway. Most, so. <laughs> most physics and astronomy professors will probably require us to go look at it. <laughs> <laughs> but since we're still on this, you know, fun little train of eclipses, we do actually have another um, eclipse coming up. This will be a, a lunar eclipse instead of a solar. And essentially what happens is the earth is in between the moon and the sun and so the earth shadow casts on the moon and it gives it a nice like really reddish orange color but we only have about like six percent coverage so we're not really gonna see too much but if any of our viewers are in a different location not in muncie you may have better luck than us so hopefully we'll be able to enjoy that and now stepping away from our talk about eclipses that we've seen or are yet to come, we are actually in meteor shower season. So 
the meteor shower for this specific time right now is actually the Orionid meteor shower. So if anyone would like to talk specifically about it, go ahead and take the wheel. Yeah, so the Orionid meteor shower is one of two meteor showers that are produced by Halley's Comet. Uh, these meteors will enter Earth's atmosphere at about uh, 41 miles or 66 kilometers per second, which is very fast. Uh, their speed is caused by the meteors and Earth moving in opposite directions. Um, the meteors leave trails of ionized gas that we can see after a couple of seconds, maybe, and then they disappear, but maybe a few might leave persistent uh, trains that you can see for a bit longer um, in the sky. The Orionids get their name from the constellation Orion the Hunter, who would have thought? Um, they get that name because Orion is their radium, the radium point is near that constellation. And the radium point is where the meteors will project from and they move outwards in all directions from that point. Nice, that was a really nice cover about what is gonna be happening during the Orionid. Honestly, I have, never actually looked at a meteor shower i've only looked at them through like tv or any other types of media to really only get my understanding of what i have now so it's honestly cool that we are talking about this now i learn a bit more and everyone else can learn a bit more including all the viewers that we have at home but before we really talk about viewing them and what's going to be happening we should actually cover how they happen and would anybody like to take this away? Yeah, I got it. So basically the Orionid meteors <laughs> are caused by the debris from comets that once passed Earth's orbital path. So in this specific case, the debris comes from Halley's Comet. So Halley's Comet was the first comet whose return was predicted. The calculations were done by Edmund Halley, which is where its name uh, comes from. So this comet completes an orbit around the sun approximately every 76 years. Similar to the steam emitted from a locomotive, which is like um, an engine that powers a train, dust particles are discharged from the comet's nucleus. So the earth then passes through these particles and debris and bits and the bits collide with our atmosphere, which is what causes those fiery colorful streaks in the sky. And similar to Kyrie, I've actually never seen one either. So. I'm actually excited to be learning about it and talking about it more. You know, Constellation Crew has honestly just been a gateway for me to learn about a bunch of space facts that I never knew before. And I'd also be able to share that knowledge with everyone else. So that's actually one of the really main reasons why I love Constellation Crew. And I hope you eventually will be able to share that enjoyment as we move on. But this is a great start. So, well... With that pretty much said, we can talk about viewing and even though you can't look up at the sky right now because it is overcast and like nearing the end of the day, here we have our wonderful program called Stellarium. And with this, we can actually simulate what the night sky will be here in Muncie during whatever time that we really choose. So right now I have the time set for 3 a.m. at um, 10 22nd or october on a sunday literally two days from now and we are looking at our night sky and like we mentioned before these are the orionid meteor showers so they are going to be you know really close to orion and with stellarium's help we can actually really simulate how we're going to be able to find it so orion rises in the east at around midnight on our sunday and the easiest way that you can really find Orion, how I typically do it, is look for Orion's belt. So you see these three bright objects in the sky here, and they perform, they perform, they form a straight line, and this is Orion's belt. And they're not just stars, but unfortunately, I'd love to talk a bit more about Orion, but we are focusing on the meteor shower. So now using these stars, you can sort of imagine a checkmark shape with um orion's brightest scar brightest scar star betelgeuse it's a um, really bright orange star and with that you can sort of create a really cool check mark with these four bright objects and by combining betelgeuse and the corner of our check mark 
um on attack we can make a straight line and continue going northeast sort of and by following this line this will lead you into orion's arm and as we mentioned before about how meteors start from a radiant and then spread out you know all different types of directions the radiant will actually be actually be right next to orion's arm sort of in this general location that i'm pointing at right here with the cursor and so with that said that's really the best way to really try to be able to look for the radiant and see where these meteor showers actually originate so remember look for orion's belt and then make a sort of check mark shape using betel geese and then using betel geese in the corner of the check mark or alternac you can create a line to reach Orion's arm. And that's where the radiant of our meteor shower will be located. And then of course, we do have a few general tips for being able to view the meteor shower. And one thing that I do really want to emphasize is that this is a really faint meteor shower and it's really infrequent. So you're going to be having about maybe 20 meteors per hour and they're moving really fast at roughly 67 kilometers per second somewhere around that distance so just knowing that if you really want to view these meteor showers you you got to be really patient and then another thing that you have to note about is that i said that this is a faint meteor shower so if you're in an area with a lot of light pollution like a city it's going to be really hard to see all the meteors. So make sure that when you're really invested into trying to see these meteor showers, especially if it's like your first time, I really do recommend meteor showers are a really cool thing to look at. Like I said, I've never seen one in person, but through um, various cartoons and other TV shows, informational or fictional, they seem really cool. So I do recommend that you do go out and really try to look for it and be really patient go to an area with less light pollution um stay away from cities and therefore you will have a better chance at being able to view the meteor shower any other hints or tips that you guys may want to give to our viewers or just bits of encouragement yeah i just want to add like even if you you might not see like kind of Kyrie said it's very infrequent so you might not see anything so just kind of prepare yourself for that and you know don't be too disappointed you know it happens um, yeah i think people hear the word shower and they think oh there's gonna be a whole bunch of them like it's like raining um that's not really what happens definitely a lot of patience yeah nice i really like these tips and last but certainly not least for the times that you'll want to be seeing them the best times for us would be midnight for October 21st, which would be our Saturday, or October 22nd, which would be our Sunday, as well as a few hours before dawn for Sunday as well. And that dawn should be our best viewing times. And as I mentioned before, Orion will be rising out in the east. So just make sure to look out in that direction and really look out for Orion's belt so you can really make that check mark and find the radiant for our meteor shower here. But we're not just gonna talk about meteor showers. It's not just meteor shower season, but it's also spooky season. Who's ready for Halloween, crew? Me. I am. <laughs> you guys have your, um, are you guys gonna do costumes? Are you thinking about them? Are you not? I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about maybe being Velma. Okay, okay. <laughs> what about you, Jessica? Um, so I actually came up with this last night, okay. talking to a friend. Um, I'm gonna be Shrek. Okay. Yeah, I I really feel like I think it'd be really funny. <laughs> I love that. I love Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> What I think I need you to do is like tell me when you're fully dressed in Shrek so I can come. I know. Over. I think I might get like a face, like a huge like mask thing and everything. <laughs> well, um, although everyone else may be dressing up, there are celestial objects that also dress up, if you will, <laughs> and sort of really <laughs> fit along this spooky season. So it's not just going to be us, you know, walking around as Shrek or Velma or me who's going to be. Uh, random civilian because I don't know what I'm going to be <laughs> but 
there are many objects in the sky that really do look like a lot of, you know, very spooky and scary things. So the first thing that I personally would like to cover, since, you know, I've been putting a lot of stress on our crew, you know, I gotta, you know, take the realm, I mean, take the helm sometimes. And I would like to talk about the Perseus molecular cloud. But before I go too deep into that, I should really talk about what a molecular cloud is in the first place. And these molecular clouds are interstellar clouds of gas and dust. Um, so just like imagine like a really big cloud out in space and it's just filled with all these gases, um, just a bunch of dust. And these are really cold and dark. And because of this, they're really hard to see through normal means of visual light. So, you know, the light that we use to see every day that bounces off our eyes, these clouds can't be found using those kinds of light. There are various other types of light. Um, if you are familiar, there's stuff like infrared, radio, and these other types of light are really how we see these um, molecular clouds. And as I mentioned before, they're not just dark, but they're really, really cold. And on average, they can be 10 degrees Kelvin or negative 447 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're going out there, you know, you might want to have a coat, a space heater, you know, honestly, just bring everything <laughs> because you will not be having a fun time if you know, find yourself in an interstellar cl um, cloud. But jokes aside, these clouds are also like really dense and have a lot of size. And this is how these and this is really how a lot of molecules in space can be made, specifically hydrogen. It's because of the density of these clouds and the size that these clouds can cause the formation of molecules such as hydrogen. But there are also many types of molecular clouds. And the one molecular cloud type that I want to focus on are giant molecular clouds. And for obvious reasons, the reason they're called giant molecular clouds is that they're very, very large. Um, specifically, a giant molecular cloud is basically indicated by having at least more than 10,000 times the mass of the sun. So it's really, really massive. And you can just imagine like all these suns like in one big cloud and there's your giant molecular cloud. And specifically with uh, the cloud that I'm going to be looking at, or we're all going to be looking at, is Perseus. It's 500 light years in width. So again, light years is the distance that light travels within a year. And 500 light years is really, really large. To put that in perspective, one light year is about 6 trillion miles. So just imagine 6 trillion miles times 500. Uh, that's not going to be the greatest road trip that I will ever want to take. Um, I don't know how many times I'd be looping around the earth, but you know, who knows? It, it, it's just not bad. It's only what, uh, what is that? 30 trillion? I mean, 3,000, uh, 3,000 trillion. Yeah, nah, no big deal. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but with this image that we have up here and why it's connected to the spooky season of Halloween, to me, it really looks like a flaming skeleton coming out of the pits and like, breathing fire <laughs> and honestly that's why i really love the Perseus molecular cloud this um image is taken by um the spitzer space telescope back in 2019 and this telescope is an infrared telescope so like i mentioned there are various types of light and infrared is one of them and this is the light that we used in order to get this image and we get this really fun image of a spooky, scary skeleton, and they'll send shivers down your spine. <laughs> but we don't just have the Perseus molecular cloud. There is a bunch of really cool objects that can really tie into Halloween. So does anyone want to talk about an object that they really like or they looked into? Yeah, I'll do it. Um, I really like the ghost nebula. Okay. It is so cute. <laughs> um, so the ghost nebula is a reflection nebula. So the nebula itself doesn't produce any light, but the light from nearby stars um, reflects and gives it kind of its color and its glow. And it's located 1,470 light years away in, in the constellation Cepheus, and it's in the northern hemisphere. Uh, but it's it's quite small. It's only two light years in width, so it's got nothing on the Perseus molecular cloud. 
Uh, so it's definitely a bit smaller, and, but you can see it with a telescope if your focal point is over 1000 millimeters. You might be able to see it, but it's really small and because of light pollution, you might need a higher grade telescope to view it if you're into that. Um, so as you can see, it's got kind of this very brown tone and it gets those brown tones from new stars. So the nebula contains d dense dust and gas and that has the potential to collapse and create new stars, which it does. And it, I think it currently is like growing a star, I think, right now, which I think is very cool. Um, and as you can see, it looks a little ghoulish. So that is why it's called the Ghost Nebula, because it looks like these little ghouls sitting with or standing with their hands upright like that. I think it's pretty a pretty cute nebula if, as far as nebulas go. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really cool nebula. Honestly, the first time I ever saw this nebula, it didn't have this image where there was another piece of the nebula and it looked like a ghost actually flying through the sky. I saw this image and I thought it looked like spilt milk. So <laughs> I didn't really get the sentiment until somebody explained that, you know, the ghost's little hands are, you no, know, they're poking out and it kind of looks like they're trying to scare us from, you know, so many trillion miles away. Yeah, it's kind of giving spilled chocolate milk a little bit. <laughs> see, I'm not weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I see it. I definitely see it. Well, Last but not least, Maya, do you have any objects that you would like to talk about? I actually do. Okay. So there's one called the Black Widow Nebula, and it gets its name because it really resembles a Black Widow spider. It's actually pretty cool. It's like, it has this reddish color that's actually really cool. Um, so the Black Widow Nebula is what is called an emission nebula. So that's basically a vast glowing cloud in a space that's compromised of gas and dust. Um, so this nebula is located approximately 10,000 light years away. So 500 light years is a lot, you know, 10,000, 500 is nothing. <laughs> or it, what most astronomers and physicists use is a unit called parsecs. Um, so if you want to equate it to that, it'd be 3,600 parsecs away from the earth. Um, so basically it sits just above the galactic plane in the southern constellation of Circanus. I think I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> um, but basically the Black Widow Nebula is practically invisible at optical wavelengths. Um, its Black Widow-like appearance can be revealed through an infrared filter. So the Spitzer Space Telescope utilizes an ultra-sensitive infrared telescope and that is actually um, how we found the Black Widow Nebula. Um, so for the formation of this nebula, you want to think of a big cloud made from gas and dust, that emission nebula. Um, so this cloud is squeezed together to make groups of big um, new stars. And the strong winds from these groups are likely what uh, pushed out the bubbles, where it's easiest making a double bubble shape, which is like the body. And then um, it also pushes out long, wispy streams that kind of make it look like spider legs. So I hope that explanation made sense, but I was basically trying to explain how the shape came about, um, that spider leg shape. But yeah, I think it's a really cool and spooky one to look at. <laughs> yep. I really like the shape of it, honestly, to all you Marvel fans out there. The first time mm -hmm. I saw it, I could only think of Miles Morales. <laughs> The um, <laughs> Spider-Man who has a black yes. outfit and his spider symbol, symbol, his symbol is red. And just with space being so dark, just the actual red spider and then the dark background, I just instantly thought of <laughs> Miles Morales and his Spider-Man suit. Yes, and I love Spider-Man too, so you know that really ties in. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, even though we've only talked about three objects that are in the sky, there are plenty more of nebula or molecular clouds or really anything that can really fit into the spooky season that we have and unfortunately even though we don't have all the time in the world i wish we do i wish we did i honestly do enjoy talking here on constellation crew you can actually still learn more about the spooky season and how that relates to the night sky if you come to our very own brown planetarium where we will be hosting our halloween celestial origin show this weekend so be there or be square and with that really pretty much said, does anyone have any closing remarks, any cool things that they want to talk about? 
No, but this was really fun. It's nice to learn all these things from the both of you. And I hope the viewers at home are going to be learning a whole bunch as well. Yep, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> like <laughs> I said, I'm, and everything. <laughs> like I said, I'm happy to be here too. It's honestly been a bit too long, you know, with us having a short little break even after the summer seat the summer <laughs> the summer break. But with that pretty much said, I would like to thank everybody at home who really came drop who came here, dropped by and visited. I really hope you learned a a bit of cool things about eclipses or maybe the upcoming meteor shower or even about all the spooky objects that we have in our night sky and with that pretty much said i'd like to say thank you so much for coming to our constellation crew um and we'll be back here not the same time but same channel <laughs>